Hey, what's up? It's John from the YouTube channel Procrafts. Back in 2021, we did a 24-hour telethon to raise funds for the National Council on Problem Gambling. In fact, we raised over $6,000 to raise awareness and provide resources for those with gambling problems. As part of the telethon, we interviewed over 20 of the biggest names in gambling to get their perspective on gambling issues, gambling problems, their experiences, and of course, have a little bit of fun with them. I had a fascinating time talking with Charlie from Junk Guy Explains. Check this out. Yeah. There you go. Hey, man. All right. Look at that. Oof. We did this. <laughs> yeah, it took a, a small act of miracle to get that to work. I'm telling you. You know what? It's funny. Like, and I said this in the very first hour. Like, we, we came out of this thing like limping on one foot with toes missing. Like, it was really hard to get out of the gate because technology it does what it does, right? And like, yeah, it's supposed to be streaming on 30 channels and it's streaming on two. I don't know if it's a time zone thing. I'm trying to get it figured out, but we're here. We made it right. So we're good. <laughs> Heck How's yeah. it going? Man, it has been a long day, but I do have crown peach and Dr. Pepper. So I'm just like slowly pickling yeah, myself yeah. to death before I can stay here and get out the door. That's awesome. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm hearing that my, my audio is not very loud. So let me go ahead and bump this up and see if that helps a little bit. All right. So um, questions for you out of the gate here. So I, you got a lot of, a lot of folks that love your system, right? Um, but before we talk about that, and I want to get to that for sure, let's talk about money management and why we're here. We're here for problem gambling, right? So I know that money management is a big deal. It's one of the things in this idea of chasing, chasing, chasing is what gets people into, into a bad situation. And you're known for bringing big bankroll, right? So talk to us a little bit about- yeah. How do you manage that? What, what do you just, how do you decide to bring what you bring and how do you like get yourself out of there? Like what's, how does your brain work in terms of just the money part strategy aside? The strategy aside, like, you know, for me, when I started out, uh, I had a prayer and no idea how to play craps. And I was so utterly petrified coming from South Georgia and not knowing like anything about like gambling or anything. All I knew was that if you gamble, you will be naked on the side of the Vegas trip one day. So like I was just petrified. So I roll up in Eureka's Casino in 2009, like back in the day, Mesquite, Nevada. I was so petrified that I was going to lose everything I ever had that I just took in $50 of my driver's license, left my wallet, left every my phone, everything into the car. And so that $50 by luck, no strategy, just luck, I got $150. Well, then I was like, I should really learn how to play craps, like learn the game. And slowly but surely, you know, I went from $50 to immediately to $200, $200 for about two or three years, and then to $750 for about two or three years, then to about $3,600, then $5,000. And now I'm at uh, usually operating between twenty dollars and $30,000. So in saying the bankroll management, you know, I always tell people is that if you picture yourself as a financial advisor, right, the first thing they'll say is that if you spend $12 and make $10, it doesn't matter if I give you a hundred thousand dollars, you're going to spend $120,000. Just, just the behavior itself mm -hmm. that just drives that kind of force behind your behavior. And so in saying that, you know, for me, I used to tell people like, Oh man, you have such a big bankroll. I was like, well, I don't really look at it like a big bankroll. A lot of times I say you look at it very much. So at least in my system is that you should only be operating with five or 10% of your total bankroll or total money you're allowing to yourself. Mm -hmm. If you're not playing my strategy, if you're playing just any strategy, I'd tell people like, listen, first of all, 90% of it's just insurance. 10% is your operating cost. On that 10%, 5% is your stop loss. 7% is your bare bottom. I'm gonna get out there and go like that. And so a lot of times when it comes to craps, I like to say it's, you know, a lot about the money management, money management and bankroll management is the fact that you have to mentally be prepared what are you going to do? How much you're going to invest into that and stick to that. And I say that with the most honesty because, you know, I'm sure anyone who is a gambler, you know, seen a poker guy or some kind of clip of poker people saying, man, I just lost 20 bucks. I'll buy him for 20 more dollars and get it back. Lose another 20 bucks. I'll buy him for $40 and get it back and $80 and get it back, 160. And it turns into this almost like every person that I've talked to that had that kind of experience, they always in that session, like, what did I just do? Like what, what just happened? How did I just like ship all that money? And, you know, to me, the casino makes money five and $10 at a time, dollar at a time in slots. You make money five and $10 at a time, sometimes a dollar at a time. So nothing, if it's fast, it's fast both ways. So in terms of bankroll management, 
I'm a big proponent of don't play with anything you're not willing to lose. That's number one. I think that's pretty much the rule of anything. Uh, rule number two is, and I know I say to my people, like, hey, like, you know, I tell everyone never go to the casino until you make $100,000 at home. If you can make it at home, you can absolutely make it there. And a lot of people don't take that advice, and I say, you know, stick to that plan. But in my drunken, I guess, drunk DGE kind of answer to that, like, hey, man, if you're going to sit here and work a system, then you better be prepared to take that system to its very end. If you already have the mentality of, I am not so sure I want to play this way, then you shouldn't be playing at all. And in terms of the gambling stuff, everyone has their little two cents of, I call it snake old salesman kind of mentality. And at the end of the day, if you got a problem, you shouldn't be playing. I mean, if you're, if you're a drinker and you can't stop drinking, don't try to have one drink. If you're a gambler, you got a problem, you shouldn't be making one bet. And so, and that's just me going down the rabbit hole of, you know, moderation in life. You know, you can yeah. sit here and go yeah. left, right, and center, but moderation. Yeah, that's fantastic advice. I mean, it, it's, the funny thing is, not funny, I guess, but it sounds so like common sense, right? You can't have a drink, don't have a drink. But people, that doesn't click always. There's a, you know, there's a piece missing, you know? What's the psychology? You know, think about this. Um, do you know that this is how crazy this is, that the demographic for the app Angry Birds, uh, some people know it, some people don't. Angry Birds, it was so popular in kids that five years later when those kids hit a key demographic of 17 to 18 years old, they actually imitated that motion of swiping uh, left and right for the slingshot. They actually kept that motion for the algorithm for 10 different some of these dating apps because inherently it's a psychology that you want to keep left, right, left, right. And that comes from Angry Birds. And they figured out that it's just more common instead of going up and down, it's more common for someone to go left and right. When you look at casinos as a whole, what are they doing? They're enticing you with comps. You're paying a pretty top dollar for those comps. Mm -hmm. And that's your money that you're paying for. But you got comps coming in, oxygen pumping in, no windows, no concept of time. You know, so that when they say seven out, they do it whispering light. They're doing everything in there possibly on a craps table from the mm -hmm. layout to the payouts, all the way to the slots in the front door to get you in and get all your money. And it's kind of, to me, it's one of those things that when you look at a, uh, a gambling bet inside a casino, legally they say it's a contract bet. That means a bet made in good faith between the party and the gambler or the customer. And so when you sit here and get blackout drunk, you shouldn't, they won't allow you to make a bet because of X, Y, and Z. Um, something that ran into me, this kind of shows you guys about bankroll management. And I know this is kind of a, a weird roundabout. So there's a lot of stories and myths around high bankroll craps and a lot of them are kind of false. I know that sounds weird, but in my experience, I've done a lot of things. I've done a lot of make rolls and I've made a lot of money and I've never had an issue with all the things that people say, but I'm going to give you, for instance, about gambling and how much they're trying to take your money. And they don't care about your well-being. I try to transfer a hundred thousand dollars into a casino and they wouldn't mark that bet. It says you're a strong player. We're just not going to allow that wire, not a line of credit, not uh, some left, right, and center thing. It was a hundred thousand dollar wire from my bank account, and then like, yeah, we're not gonna do that. Based on your play, we can hmm. do twenty thousand dollars. I was like, that's kind of weird. Get twenty thousand in. Did the first DG meetup, had X amount of people there, had a great time. Get a phone call the next week. Hey, uh, did you enjoy your stay? And I was like, I did. And they said, oh, now you can only wire in five thousand. Hmm. And I got, I got a little sideways about that, and I was like, you know, what, what's the deal here? And they said, well, you know. Just based on your action, based on your player score, we just don't justify you bringing in 100,000. Now, in saying that, that's just because of their policies, whatever, doesn't matter. But when they wouldn't accept that 100,000 play, they had a comment and they said, well, we'll give you 20,000. And if you lose the 20,000, we can talk about more. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't believe that that was the real reason they said that. However, if based on that knowledge, this is what it says to me, is that if they see that potentially something could happen to where someone can bring $100,000 in and actually take them for a serious amount, they're trying to limit that kind of liability. Now, in saying that, they're looking at me saying, well, it's for your well-being, sir, that you have $100,000 and we're going to let you do $20,000 because X, Y, and Z. Now, that sounds all good and dandy as a high roller, but at the same time, do you really think they're looking at, let's just say, Joe Mechanic? that's taking an $800 paycheck that they, he needs, and they're looking at him saying, hey, you don't need to be mm -hmm. betting that amount. We're going to let you take in $200. Right. They're not. So understand that they're a business, and the bankroll management is your checks and balances with your own ego and id and your own greed facing a casino that really doesn't care about anything but your money. Now, they can be an entertainment company all they want to, but they are there to entertain and to make money at the same time.
So that's that's ties in what David said in the first hour, right? Dave was talking as the dealer side of that whole thing. It's like they don't give a crap. And and the, the the story he told about the guy who turned him lost his family went became a taxi cab driver. It's the same thing. They don't give a crap. You know, he yeah. shouldn't be gambling. I mean, it is three fifty, right? I mean, and at the end of the day, you know, it is a business and they're there to make money no matter what. It's not, it's, it's only even because you agree to their odds. And so a lot of times when you talk about bankroll management versus greed or a gambling addiction, a lot of times you have to look at yourself saying, Hey man, are you giving an, a portion of your paycheck to your hobby and how much time you want to dedicate to it? You don't have to collect, you don't collect cars and blow money in gambling. The same thing, pick your vice, stick with it. If it's something that I think is crippling or I always look at it and this is going to sound so horrible. I grew up poor. I love equating things to food. That is like my bread and butter. When I was in college, I spent an entire summer looking beautiful on $30 of a budget for the whole four months. It was beautiful. Rice every day, that is the most economical thing. However, if you really want to put into, I guess, perspective, because they do stuff like use chips instead of cash to dissociate your money from yourself, but uh, equate everything to food. And it's beautiful. For instance, you know, I'll sit here and have like an $8,000 lay on the eight. And I'm like, okay, $8,000 lay, that's going to be a $200 VIG, so $8,200. So I can get about a quarter pounder for a buck 25. So that's 7,500 plus tax. So let's just say 7,200 7, cheeseburgers I can cut in half. So that's going to be 14,400 cheeseburgers I have once a day for a caloric intake. So in saying that, that bet that you made potentially could make you a cheeseburger rich for about 17 years. So when you sit here and look at somebody and say, hey, Jack, like you're betting a Miata out there. Like that's a Chevrolet. Mm -hmm. That's a Chevrolet or Lamborghini's, depending on how that bed goes. You can be on shoes. You can be in a car. Do you want to go to Ruth Chris or do you want to McDonald's? And so when you start doing food comparisons to bets, it really puts in perspective. Like if you have a TV, you say I'm betting six LED TVs right now, 70 inches. Do I have mm -hmm. brand new LEDs? I don't. Okay. Do I want one? Yes. I don't even have to make this bet. Let me just go buy an LED TV. And that really keeps uh, a lot of the ego in check. So that's kind of like my little, I know it sounds stupid, but that's kind of how I kind of keep equating the bankroll not management to greed and stuff like that. No, that's not stupid at all. I mean, if, in fact, like, putting something tangible on it is, a, is, I think, an important thing. That's a TV you just put out there. I, I love that's, And you don't think about that. You know, even when you're no. a, like a press better, you know, even if your, your risk was 20 bucks or 30 bucks and you press, 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 and you, know, you got, you got it up to, you know, 350, you go, cool. I'm yeah. doing great. You know? And like, yeah, you got, like you said, a couple of TV, you got it. That's 350 is a solid TV right now. 350 is a, car you know, and yeah, yeah your risk was 30 and you lose your 350 and you're like, oh, that sucked. No, that really, really, really sucked. Like you just yeah. away I mean, and guess bucks, what, you know? And yeah, I tell people all the time, especially with the bankroll management stuff, you know, they because a lot of times they look at me and they say, well, you got 5,000, you pay yourself out. I'm like, 5,000, I'm operating under 500, 10,000, I'm operating 1,000, 20,000, I'm operating maybe 1,500. You know, so 30,000, I might get a little splashy. But essentially what I'm doing is that in that management of funds, I'm sitting here and this kind of backdoors into the strategy. But it's like, listen, you know, you start small no matter what and you build up. I'm definitely a progressive better in a lot of things. And I'm definitely... Um, I, I call it an edge better, but basically I'm just using tangents and weird things that happen on the table and using that to my advantage. And so, you know, the reason why I have such a big bankroll and I don't mind using a big bankroll, the, I tell the guys at the meetup, I tell people on the live events, the biggest thing is like, guys, first of all, I'm the idiot that came up with this stupid stuff. So like, yeah, understand that I'm like going to go down the ship like the Titanic. I'll sit here and have a violin playing all the way to just broke them. I don't care. And so that's number one. Number two, if you're gonna if you're gonna do something and that's what you did in practice, you might as well do it in play. And I know that sounds bad, but you know there's been tons of times, and I'll be honest with you guys, is that when you have big bets out there and you're at the end of I would say your progression, you're at one of the the higher ends of it. You're just like this is all fake. This is totally fake. I just I've been lying to myself. I'm just like the luckiest person in the world. I've been lying to myself. We're totally gonna go broke. And then it happens. You're like all right, we're good. So I mean, in saying that. A lot of times with progressive betters, people that like to press betters, I always tell them, coming from somebody that's gone all the way to a very, very large lay before in Bellagio and very large private tables, I can tell you guys, like, at the end of the day, you'd much rather wait and do a smaller bet than get it all in. I mean, like, that's my biggest thing if you're progressing. It's okay to wait versus 
you know, putting 20,000 in just to get paid off still. Because in, especially when you're doing a lot of bets, if, if me and you said heads or tails and I had an infinite amount of money, I'm always going to win against you because I have an infinite amount. I can just keep doubling my bet. And as long as you keep agreeing to it, I'm eventually going to win. And so when I tell people like, you know, when you sit here and do these betting and you do these little angle shoots, understand your range, just like anything else. Poker has a range. I base a lot of my mentality on poker especially for progressive betting, because in my mind, if you have $10 and I have $1,000, you have to be perfect in a poker game with me 100% of the time. I only have to be right one out of 10 times. And the reason why is because if I go all in, you go in, cool, you got 10 off me, then you get 20 off me, then 40, then 160. And I'm like, hey, you can sit here and do this X, Y, and Z. Now, a lot of times in progressive betting, especially with my stuff, a lot of people do the gambler's fallacy. And uh, that's one of the things I was gonna talk to you about mm -hmm. is that, you know, the gambler's fallacy is very much geared toward a flip a quarter and it comes up 20, you know, heads that, okay, well, you've done that three times in a row. I'm going to keep flipping it. And eventually it has to be, there's a greater probability it's going to be a tails for every heads that comes out. Now, in that system between a one roll probability versus statistical dilution, I'd say like this. Yes, when you flip a coin, you are 50 50 chance no matter what. Flip, one roll, boom. However, when you have a sample size of 10,000, uh, flips, it's going to equal out 50 50. No matter how much people want to go, it 10,000 rolls, 10,000 flips, 10,000 is universally the sample size minimum for a lot of things in terms of statistical probability. So, in saying that, if I say, okay, in 10,000 rolls that we sit here and I see 10,000 rolls, I see 2007. So, 2007 means that correlatively with a margin of 2% up or down, there's going to be 2,000, there's going to be 1,004 is rolled and 1,010 rolls. Now, in saying that, that you can't refute that. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times you hear people stay in poker sessions. Um, this is a great thing. They'll say, hey, you know, I have aces full of eights. I can lose to quads. Okay, so if someone has quad aces or quad eights, they're going to get me. What someone will say as a poker player says, I will keep making the same bet because in saying that bet, over my career of playing poker, every time I hit this instance, two out of 100 times will be quads over my boat, but 98 over 100 times my boat is going to be the nuts. Craps is a continually number engine that produces data for you. So a lot of times when I look at someone, I was like, man, I'm playing lifetime craps. Over 10,000 rolls, a million rolls in my entire life, this is what I'm going to experience. And so a lot of times people are saying, well, I've seen weird things happen with craps. I'm like, you should. However, if I told you, John, I was like, well, we're going to sit here and say, hey, I'm going to give you a million to one odds that you can roll a hard nine. You give me a dollar, I'll give you a million dollars. Can you roll a hard nine? And they're like, it's impossible to roll a hard nine. I'm like, but it's a million to one odds. They say, <laughs> well, and that's what, you know, the fire bet. Right. So when I say people to the range thing, I say, you know, for my lay in 410 gambit, which is after four – after four fours have been thrown before a seven, I'll start laying and progressing it up as it goes on. And they're like, oh, it's a game versus fallacy. I'm like, listen, the odds of rolling a seven before four is two to one, 50%. So you're 50% more likely to roll that or two to one favorite, whatever one you call it, for the odds. You're two to one favorite to roll a seven versus a four. So if you look at four fours being thrown from a seven, every single time it's getting harder and harder. So to put it into a good example is that you – are sitting here driving down the road and you fill up for gas. I think that 80% of the time that you're going to fill up your gas tank when it's a quarter of a tank or less. Now, are you going to fill up in a half tank? Absolutely. You're going to fill up when you're almost full. Absolutely. So that right there is saying 80% of the time, I think you're going to fill up with a quarter tank or less. Now, not only am I making that bet, I'm saying that you have to fill up your tank four times without it being a quarter or less. So half, full, three quarters. You do that four times before I put a bet into a lay. And so it's when you grab those statistical anomalies that you're like, okay, this is where I'm gonna go with, and that's the lay in four. And the progressive stuff really isn't a issue of, hey, am I chasing a statistic? Because you kind of know where your ranges are, but in the same sign, you're like in 10,000 rolls, this is the average you should see. So in 10,000 rolls or more, you should be sitting here seeing the same pyramid of statistics in X, Y, and Z. Now, so, the betting – oh, sorry. Let me ask you a quick question about that because I think the gas tech analogy is interesting, right? So you're going to bet that most of the time 
80% of the time I'm going to fill up when I'm at quarter tank or low, or low. but it takes three yes. times to be not doing that before you'll start making that bet. Right. And then you can do it eight more times, eight more times. Cause that's what I'm and getting at is trends because you're going, the trend says like, great. The casino sees this. We see this because we're there for short periods of time. We're not there for 10,000. We're there for 50 rolls or hundred rolls. So in the short term Correct. trend and the trend in that short, in, in the trip that I drove from Seattle to Vegas in that trip, four times I filled up at half tank because I was scared. I wouldn't see it. Whatever. Is that a trend Correct. or you're saying, no, it's more likely he's still going to go let it run down to, to that's what I want to like the difference between fallacy and that, I guess, and fallacy and trend. Correct. You have a way of looking at that. That's and really so, and so for instance, there's something called a lot of times people say, well, if I've rolled 10 sevens, there should be five tens. Let's just use tens as an example. Mm -hmm. So you know, this is a lot of times people make this mistake in math is that they'll say, okay, well, if 10 sevens been rolled. There's five tens that are due. You've rolled one 10. I should see four more tens before I see another seven, which is false. There's something called statistical dilution. So statistics don't reconcile, they dilute. As in, over the course of the next keep filling up, it'll slowly keep from running that pyramid. So let's mm -hmm. say you have 10 sevens and only one 10. Well, you might see 10 more sevens and two more tens. But eventually, over a sample size of 10,000 rolls, you should see 50% less tens than you do four or sevens. So in saying that, when I look at those tangents, I say, no matter what, let's just say if you don't believe in statistical dilution, then let's just say this. Every single bet that I make is a two to one favorite. So every single time I bet on the four, you're a two to one favorite to make that the late bet win the seven. It just doesn't matter if you're just not even saying the statistical probability of it, but just right there on the heads of one roll probability. Now, in terms of the gas tank, the way I look at it is that I got into a huge argument with a person called Systems33 on Reddit. And he happened to be a programmer. And he was like, listen, Kat, uh, your strategy is trash. And I was like, most likely. He's like, there's no way you've won money. I was like, yeah, I've won money after like seven years now. Like, so either I'm one lucky mofo or like, it's, it's going down. Like, I don't know, man. Like, I, I don't know what to tell you. And the fact that I guess someone's you're seriously lucky, he's like, I can run this into some program. I'm not a very tech guy. So he's like, I can create a program, run the simulation, run the parameters in which you set up your strategies, and then we can go like that. And I was like, okay, hey, let's, let's do that. Get a you know, message back, did all the parameters, came back and says, I need to get a little bit more data from you. I was like, why is that? He's like, well, I just ran it for a billion rolls, and you're up like 2.1 million. I was like, well, that seems a little cool. <laughs> I mean, that's right. sweet. Gave him some more stuff and kept going. And he says, and I don't know if this is real or not. I'm not a computer guy, but he did say, he was like, dude, you're a 20% player edge on this. And I was like, sweet. I was like, that's cool. Mm -hmm. And I asked him two questions. Now, whether I believe his data or not, I, don't care. I really don't. Like, that's just, that's his math and prerogative that I don't understand. But I asked him, I was like, hey, can you look at the, um, can you look at the actual role history and tell me a couple of things? And he said, yeah. I said, well, how many non-fields in a row did you see? And he said, 15. I said, over a billion rolls, there's 15 non-fields. And he's like, yeah. I was like, all right, well, cool. So I set up a strategy for field progressive to 16 non-fields. Mm. Just like that. I was like, so now you're just talking about your bankroll, staggering your last bet back to your first bet and finding the range, how many non-fields before you can see your bet. So it's the same thing, like six or five non-fields, and then you start progressive betting on the field bet. Same thing for the four and 10. Hey, out of a billion rolls, how many fours in, in between a seven or tens in between a seven? And he told me eight. I was like, okay, so I'll base it off nine. And so I just took a billion roll sample size and back betted it. So essentially, mm. it's almost like you're speculating your own bet. So I took a, a billion roll statistic and said, what's a really good bet? And one of them that to use as an example that the casino said is that <clears throat> when you stay here and do a fire bet, they have to post a statistic for the fire bet. The odds of you winning that fire bet is 0.13% to six unique points on a fire bet when they had it. Mm -hmm. So in using that logic thing, if that means that when you're on the sixth unique point, you are 99.87% favored to lose the comeback. In my mind, I was like, okay, so that means that you're a 99 percent favorite to win the don't pass bet on the six unique point back bet that and say okay that's a reverse fire bet mm -hmm. and so i'm not really banking 
on the fact that two sevens with a coming workout is going to work. I don't. I do think that the odds of you doing five sevens in a row and then hitting a six seven is a lot rarer. It's one over six to the fifth power is what that would be. The chances of you rolling five sevens in a row. And so in saying that, I say, okay, well, my bankroll can actually support up to the fifth seven or the sixth seven. So I really want to make, after five sevens, a really big bet. But the odds of you hitting that bet, that weird tangent, is pretty rare. I mean, you're not going to see that very often. So what you're doing is you're taking that almost 99% guaranteed bet, and you're coasting on the fact that that bet will mature. And so now you're going ahead of time and making smaller bets with more risk. And the fact that you know once you get to that certain criteria, you're going to sit here and hit it. And that's kind of where my logic in a lot of this goes. And a lot of times, you know, for the seven seven press, for the don't pass or reverse fire bet, the laid four and ten, the hedge four and ten, the hedge four, five and nine, and all that stuff, they're all gambits that can feed into another statistic. So if you're playing the seven seven press and you hit a six and get or excuse me, you hit a seven seven press, you wait for two sevens. You put money on the six and eight working, hit another seven, put more money out. Let's say you hit that six. Well, the six hits, get your money back, you collect. The five hits, you hedge the five uh, for the don't for one roll. See if you can hit the six and eight, which is 10 out of 36 versus the seven, which is seven out of 36, six out of 36. And then plus you have hedged on the don't. So really and truly, you're only playing to the five, which is four out of 36 versus 10 out of 36 that gets you paid for your units or the six out of 36 that gets you paid on the don't for the, for the wash. So in saying that, like you sit here and say, okay, I'm going to stay here and go to six and eight working after two sevens. So let's say on the four seven, it finds six, it gets paid. When that goes in thing, you turn everything off, and let's say you make the six point. So now you're you're sitting here waiting and you have profit. You say, okay, let's just see how this player goes. You can keep on the six and eight just to progress it, or you can just stop and take your profit. On top of that, let's say they make an eight point. Now they've made the eight point. Well, you've made two unique points in a progression of reverse fire. That can backdoor you into a don't progression. The don't progression is sitting here saying, hey, we're going to sit here and say, I'm going to put $10 on the don't, and I can survive 11 points on this, or six points with a couple of 7-11 come out. Let's say you're running that progression, and then on top of that, one of the points becomes a four. Well, now you're on a fifth unique point. It's on the four. And now you're like, holy crap, this guy's rolled 25 times. The point's of four. A seven is common in one out of six. We're on the more points you make, the less likely you are to make a point in terms of that. So now you're saying, okay, we're on a third four, a third point. I'm on the don't already for my progression for the don't. I could hedge and put a little bit more for free with no vig onto the four saying that Knowing that you've rolled 30 times, knowing you're on the third point, which is an outside number, you're already a two to one favor to lose that. Knowing that you've already rolled three, four, three fours, so your quarter tank is pretty much coming up due. Now you can say, I'm going to put more money on the odds for that. Let's say that still hits a four. Now you're on your fourth four, you're on your fifth unique point, and now you're getting closer to that 99% favor on the don't for the reverse fire bet. On top of that, you can start the progression for the late four because you've now banked off four fours, and with a five, 10, 20, $30,000 bankroll, you can survive that, and you just keep going over and over and over again. So you're playing And let's say you're on the don't. You're playing that long yeah, I mean, casino plays, but you're playing it, you're jumping into it when you think it's most advantageous based on your math. Is that kind of how you right. I mean, take, describe that? Take it like this. If someone was sitting here and you walked up to a craps table, regardless of what kind of craps player you are, let's say if you walk up to a craps table and they say, this guy has just broken the record for number two craps longest roll history. The longest, the number two is at the Harris in Philadelphia for 122 rolls, four hours and 30 minutes. In saying that, you walk up to a table, someone's been at the table for four hours and 30 minutes. They've hit nine points. Are you going to put all your money on the don't pass for the next point? Or excuse me, are you going to put all your money on the pass line for the next point? Mm. Or are in your mind you're saying, listen, he's rolled for, they've rolled for an hour and a half, so or four and a half hours. So how likely are you to put every single dime you have onto the pass line for a four and a half hour throw? And you know what? The casino banks off that kind of mentality. How many times have you seen an hour long throw and nothing's really on the table. If you'd have kept on the table, you'd have sat here and made X, Y, and Z. But a lot of times people play for 30 rolls, and a lot of people just kind of reduce their bets to the minimum, collect as they can, but they stop pressing after, let's just say, 30, 40 rolls. 
And so a lot of times with my system, you kind of capitalize in the long rolls. Um, you don't really get popped. I mean, I had a guy hit something like eight points, but only had four fours and three tens. So it's really not a lot of investment in there. So you can roll 60 times inside of a number and never hit that number. So, you know, when you look at the, my system, at least, it's a backdoor to other systems. And that's how the other systems got created was that they feed off each other. If you sat here and roll six sevens in a row, you feed in my 68. If you make four points in a row, you feed off a reverse fire. If you make a bunch of reverse fires, that means you probably box four and tens. I'm doing off that. I mean, it's all just systems that run off each other. And so to me, I never watched Dice Influencers. I didn't know that YouTube had Dice until I was already into Dice. And so in saying that, all I looked at was just the rules of craps, the math behind craps, and just keeping the lifetime edge as close as possible. And that's just essentially all of that I had based it off of. I was like, does the statistic look good? And, you know, when it comes to, you know, a lot of times in my channel, I get asked a lot, well, you, do you change your stuff out for dice influencers? Do you change your stuff out for, um, you know, X, Y, and Z? I'm like, you know, this is my personal opinion. I think that anything, they make a, a robot that can hit all in ones on par threes in the PGA. Yep. Is that if I was a dice influencer, if I could be a dice influencer, I would always play for the seven because it's the most common. And I'd stay here and try to roll sevens as much as possible. But at the end of the day, the casino makes money off lifetime statistics. They look at That's three right. tables per casino, 20 casinos in a nation, rolling 24-7, 365. They don't care if John can make $60,000 in one roll because they know that the house edge is an average of statistics across an entire year. And the yep. way I look at craps is that, how do you you know make money in craps? It's not big bets, it's not crazy stuff, it's just nickel and dime them. Because right now here is River Valley Casino in North Carolina, which is the casino I go to the most. They cleared last year, uh, make netting a profit of $400 million. And I can tell you right now, I've never seen a million dollar slot pool in there. I've never seen a $100,000 Baccarat hand. I've never seen $10,000 blackjack hands, and the craps tables are $10 and $15. They make their money off dollar slots, $5 minimum bets on the three-card poker and table games, and $10 to $15 on craps. They do it nickel and dime, one at a time. And so for me, I base a lot of my strategy on just nickel and dime on the death, slow and steady progression. And then a lot of times I look at it like this. If you can sit here and let's say, John, your first bet, you say, I'm going to do a $30, six and eight work and boom, hit $35. The biggest thing I tell people, I'm like, well, dude, like, is $35 an hour a good job to you? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, then why are you trying to make a bet within the next hour? And I say that. It's like, what if I told you, John, that you can only make one bet an hour? What situation would you let on to make that one bet? It's interesting. I, I mean, I would bet the dog, I mean, obviously, but that, that, that's me. I mean, but I see what you're saying. You're. If you're gonna make one bet per hour and that's all you can do. Mm -hmm. So I what mean, scenario was that one bet gonna be? Well, I think I, I I think you're leading me into when the when the when the table leans where I need it to lean, which is when you're seeing, I'm sorry about that. When you're seeing the number of sevens you've seen in a row or fours, whatever it is, when you see, when the opportunity exists, you pounce in. And that's kind of what you're what you're talking through. You're waiting for the yeah, for that I mean, golden that that golden What's what I'm looking for? The, this, the, the position that you, you see the table getting into. I've seen enough, enough of this thing happen. Eight no fields in a row. Time to get in the field and start. And here's the thing is also. Martin Gilling will kill you, right? Martin Gilling will kill you if you start at zero. You're basically Correct. kind of Martin and, Gilling but I don't. from the middle. Yeah, you're Martin Gilling from the middle, basically, on a lot of this stuff. Yes. Because you're, you're, um, you're, and you're, I, you're, that's the long game part of it that I was mentioning earlier. Is that right? Yes, and I, I can't remember if someone said this, and I apologize if this isn't you, but do you also delve a little bit into cryptocurrency or stock currency? I don't. My son does. So, for instance, when you have stock, right, and then people always talk about mooning and stuff like that, but stock that inherently for no reason at all but just shoots very much up, Yeah. every single time that happens, no matter what happens, I don't care what the situation is, there's always a phase called consolidation, is that the price pumps up, it consolidates back into its uh, support level, and from the support level, it then can either make a bearish or bullish market move going down or up, but it always consolidates. It doesn't matter what the stock is, it goes up, consolidates, goes down, consolidates, goes up. And that's just how the market works. And so when you sit here and say to somebody like, you know, what are you doing to put it in a stock perspective is that, listen, every scenario that I usually gamble on, it's because it's mooned in some way or dipped in some way. Bad day in the market drops 40% unless the entire market crashes 
you sit here and do X, Y, and Z to pop it up. And so in saying that, you sit here and you meet a certain criteria where you're saying, hey, listen, you might have ridden 60 points in the last three hours. Well, that has got to consolidate at some point. It might consolidate in a month, it might consolidate in a day. That's a lot of times when I look at craps, you can also say, hey, listen, something is going abnormally different than it's supposed to go. And realistically, past anything else, what it's supposed to do is say, hey, one out of six rolls is a seven. Doesn't matter how much you want to splice it, how much you want to do it. One out of six rolls, one out of six, six out of 36 roll combinations is going to be a seven. Three out of 36 is going to be a three and 11. And, you know, a lot of times they say, well, dice have no memory. I'm like, if that was the case, why don't we see, and I'm going to ask you this, how often, which happens a lot, how often do you see five, or excuse me, three fives or three nines rolled in a row? Pretty oh, often. So, so rare. In a row? Yeah, in a row. Yeah. Once a trip, maybe? Like what, on a weekend? Once a trip. Yeah. How many, time, how many times do you see three sevens in a row? All the time. How often do you see yeah. three twelves in a row? Almost never. Well, dice have no memory. So it should be every single time. So it's hard mm -hmm. to tell people in, in broad terms, you know, because the gambler's fallacy does a lot of things. And I'm not set, taking away anything from the gambler's fallacy. But my biggest mm -hmm. thing is this, is that no matter how much you splice it or say that there's a one roll probability, the statistical, the statistical, the probability of something happening will always remain the same. And that's how the casino makes their cash is that they say, okay, sevens is the most common. That's the end of the day. Sevens is the most common. And in fact, if you look at the betting edges, for instance, a lot of casinos, the vid, and I love to say this as an example. So you're a two to one favorite to win, right? Uh, if you lay, or if you, let's just say you're only dollar for $10 and points of four, that's already been established right there. You're two to one favorite to win that. Yep. So how do they negate that two to one favorite? Well, you have to have a come out roll, which the come out roll is just seven eleven kills you. So it's the most mm -hmm. common that can take you off the don't. That's their edge. Let's say you want to lay that. Now, most casinos, when you lay something, they take a VIG. So right. that VIG is essentially saying you're a two to one favorite. That means that you should win this two times that not. We're going to take 1.5 or five or 1% out of that because even in that payout, if you're a five to one favorite, but I only give you four to one odds, even when I lose, I'm winning I'm every winning. single yeah. time. And so it's the same thing is that, you know, look at when you look at a bet inside of a crap stable and they pay you less than what you put in, then you're favored to win. That's just inherently they make up for the odds of you winning with the amount that they pay and they keep going back and forth. It's beautiful how mathematically it sits here and puts all that stuff on. So I love the way that the math behind the table works. And so far, fingers crossed, in live play at a casino, I'm 11 years or 12 years in and I've never lost. Now in saying that, I have had a 18 hour session to get back even and I've walked away a lot of times with $1 profit. <laughs> but in saying that, I've never lost. But in saying that, I, you know, I've had a, a super large bankroll and I am the most tightest, horrible player you've ever seen. Like I have sat here and been cussed at so many times just because of the fact that like you have $10,000 and you're making a $12 and six and eight, like, yep, petrified the whole time. And so in saying that people that are watching this the, did my DGE meetup, I had 20 K and I had $14,000 on the table at one time working. And it started the $15 or 66 on the inside. I mean, you just never know how it's going to play mm -hmm. out. I was being a little bit aggressive in that point, but at the same time, the best thing I could say to somebody is this. And a lot of times when it comes to my strategy and the strategy of craps, every strategy that you have, as long as you're consistent with it, then you should run that to the ground. And I say that is that every time I've told someone's like, oh, I love your system. I want to want to play. I'm like, stay at home, make $100,000 on the system and then go. Don't even, I don't, I, I don't go unless I think any system can be good if you make $50,000. So if you sit here at home, can make $50,000 with not deviating one bit from the system, then go do it. And then once you do that, then you should in the journey of 50,000 or 100,000, know what to expect to see. And it's a hard thing for a lot of people to say that or do that. So, but I was very happy in the sense that I had a, a DG meetup this year, which is really cool. I think in total, I'm just gonna go by bankrolls. We had two sessions, a total of 14 bankrolls. And those two sessions at Harris Cherokee, we had zero losing sessions. So we had a, a bankroll ranging from 1,000 to me at 20,000. And it was 100% profit for every single bankroll that did that for that entire day. 
And so is it accurate? I don't know. And then a lot of times when people say, well, no strategy is foolproof, I'm like, yeah, probably most likely because in a live session at home, I rolled 10 tens. Then there's no way I got away from that. That's complete bankrupt. That's what people was like, I'd rather see that at home than ever see that at casino. So, but in 11 years with millions of rolls under my belt, I've never seen that before. So I was like, once in a, once in 11 years, and this is where a huge thing, I know that I'm, I'm getting like down to the last 10 minutes, but <laughs> this is the funniest thing about the gambler's fallacy that a lot of people take, not for granted, but they actually don't take into account. When me and you are doing the gambler's fallacy, it's inherent in the rules and structure of the gambler's fallacy that I am approaching you with everything. So in saying that, if I have a $5,000, and this is what I did to build these bankrolls, if I had a $5,000 bankroll, let's just do a $500 bankroll because that's more approachable to a lot of viewers. So you have a $500 bankroll, your goal is 20%. Let's say you hit that 20% five times. What's that? Boom, that's your $500. So if you have a structured bankroll of $5,000 like I did, or 750 when I started, or 200 even back then, you develop five banks of your bankroll and even now, that's why I kind of joke around. If I take $5,000 and lose it 10 times in a row, you can't not me. So the gambler's fallacy says, I have to take everything I have and beat you with it. However, for mine, if you take a 20% goal of every session in five sessions, you have $5,000 off a 5,000 bankroll. So then when you go to the casino at 5,000, that sixth visit, you can't, there is no going down. And so now, even though I've spent the money, I put a down payment on my first home back in the day and you know, spent on stupid stuff and alcohol because I'm drunk. But saying that, even now it's kind of, it's kind of iconic or moronic, not moronic, what's it say? It's kind of ironic. And the fact that, I mean, what, do you, what can you take from it? You can't because for the gambler fallacy to play out the way it should be about Martin Gales and the gambler fallacy, I'd have to take every cent I've ever earned in craps and bring it into the table. But when you say, I'm only gonna make 20%, so 5,000 makes 1,000, you come back to the next session. If you lose 5,000, you still have 1,000 left. If the third session you lose everything, you still have $2,000 or $3,000 left, so on and so forth. So in saying that, if you sat here and got all the way to you know, 12, 20, 50 sessions over the course of 10 years to one year, depends on how you wanna go with it, you got to sit here and say, I've built up enough banks. Like for me, you know, when I sat here and first developed the strategy, I sat here and said, I'm going to dedicate at least 10,000 hours because there's some weird meme that said 10,000 hours is what you take to become a professional. Totally. And I just sat here and watched TV and I went from rolling dice and moving chips to my shoulder hurting and then just moving chips and knowing where the puck is to just rolling and not even moving chips, just knowing I know where to bet and where to pay the bank or the bank pay me to the fact that I could just roll and just dish out the payments and do. Now, in the course of that five years of just 24 seven watching Netflix, drinking maliciously, I would have, I would have people, my friends say, I'm gonna teach you craps and then you can roll for me because my shoulder hurts and I can make my own bets. So in saying that, you know, now to the point where like a lot of times, I used to be like all this proud young buck, like, listen, like you just can't lose. I'm not gonna say, I don't say it anymore in the fact because it just doesn't seem relatable, it doesn't seem believable. So I say to people, if you do a system and it yields you 10 to 20% per session, that means that you have to just, you have to fade five first sessions of no weird tangents or no weird discrepancies in your session. And then you have your bankroll. And now the gambler's fallacy could, might still be in effect if you believe that what your system is doing is in, adhering to the gambler's fallacy. However, if you're a Martingale player, then you cannot lose anymore. Like me, you know, in the time I've spent playing craps, if I take, as long as I don't take more than $100,000, I can't lose. Or if I take 5,000, lose it for an entire year, I still can't net negative to what I've won. And so that's the one thing about the Martingale that people don't realize and say, okay, I'm coming in with five, John, put it for five, I get five. All right, next round, I'm coming in for four, John. Boom, come in for four. All right, next one, come in for three, John. And I kept doing it. And then until eventually I'm like, hey, I'm coming back in for five, but I have 10. So you can't, I'm not all in anymore. And that's what a lot of times I've had people in the past, they say, well, I've won $15,000 using your system. I'm going to the casino with 15,000. like, why, why? Because no matter how much money you have, you can't buy your way out of range. 
There's a minimum bet of ten dollars. If you're a ten dollar table, it's a three thousand max bet, six thousand max play. Fifteen dollar table, three thousand max bet, six thousand max play. If you're lucky, you can get five thousand max bet, ten thousand max play. Twenty five dollar table, five thousand max bet, seven thousand max play. Depends on where your scales are. I'm a ten twenty x guy. So in saying that, no matter if I take a million dollars, you can't put a million dollars onto an eight or a ten right. or something like that. So you know, when you look at that, you're like, eh, it's all going to be okay. And I see that a lot of people don't like my segment. <laughs> so I'm going to let, okay. I'm going to let you kind of cut me. I'm going to let you cut me short no, by like six good. minutes. I, I think you're, <laughs> I think it's fascinating though, because like I said, I'm not a gambler's fallacy or, or a Martingale guy. Right. So when I watch you play yeah. and listen to you talk, my first thought was if you're going to be Martingaling, you're going to, you're going to hit table max. You can't play it enough long enough to, if when you hit that shitty roll, it's going to bite yeah. you. Right. But you're yeah. part of your, your story is you need to have the massive bankroll to withstand that. And then you can fight back through it. And that's the other part of that, which is, yeah, at that session at the table, you, you there's the, that chance where the Martingale crushes you. Yeah. But if you've got hundred K and now you're down to 95 and you keep rolling through it, you're going to get it back. I see what you're, what, where you're going with that and how the math makes sense with the massive bankroll for the, for the most people who don't have that, they got to work their way into it. Right. So from your oh, yeah. side of things, which, which of your, so you've got a bunch of stuff and I try to, I tried to watch and learn all the way you do this, right? I've done it a couple of times now and where I get, where I get stuck in it is where do I start? Right. So now you've got like a well, legion of folks who are, who are all in, where do we go in your system? Because it does go, it branches off like a, like a spider web a little bit, like here, here, and you're going there. How do we, how do we learn? Like where do we jump in? Well, this is the thing. If it was me, you know, I started, I knew that it was going to be difficult to explain seven systems that feed into each other. So I started very small, sure. which is the fortune hedge. And so the fortune hedge is the points of four, put 120 on the hedge and survive three rolls. And three rolls, no matter what, you scaled on the bet, scaled on the hedge, every roll. And so you're just in the inside. And then if the third roll doesn't hit or it does hit, you take it all down. And so that's just based on the fact that you're a two to one favorite on the hedge for the don't for the odds. And you're having covering, let's just say, the points of four, the five to the ten, you have the majority of the points to hit once, twice to go, and just keep scaling down. So that was a good start for me. When I had $200 as a bankroll, and I, this is the, something that I, te I tell people on the Discord, but, you know, when I had a $200 bankroll, it was monotonous. It was horrible. It was just, but back in then, $5 tables, you could sit on that table and do nothing. It didn't matter. Mm -hmm. You know, there wasn't people kicking you off. And so yep. I'd sit here and just wait. I'd count four fours or four tens. And that was it. And just like, just $5 table, just count it, count it, count it. So I'd maybe make on $200 of April, maybe 10, 20 bucks. Now, mind you, I was traveling for work at the time. So I could make those kind of four hour, five hour sessions because it was in the route of what I was doing. And so when I realized the progression to make more of a bankroll, when I figured out what can I do in the time waiting for a lay four and 10 or a four, 10 hedge, I was like, well, the six and eight after the come out seems pretty good. Well, let me take $750 for that. And then when I started laying earlier and saying, I'm going to make big lay bets, then it turned into a $3,600 bankroll. And the reason why $3,600 is because wait till four fours or four tens have been thrown, 50, 150, 450, and then 1200. And so that's where that kind of progression came into and still have stuff to go back into. And then after that, I was like, well, hell, I never make money on the six and eight, which is the most common one to throw past the seven. You have to come out seven. The second thing is a six or 10, which is 10 out of 36 to hit one of them, not both, but one, it's 10 out of 36. You have a one third chance of always rolling a little bit under one third chance to roll a six or an eight. So in saying that, you guys sit here and say, well, okay, I want to do, I want to lay, I want to place the six and eight. Well, when can I do that? Well, the best time to do that is immediately after the seven. Because once again, you're always trying to fade one out of six rolls is a seven, six out of 36, one out of six. So I was like, all right, well, I guess I'll just do it at, immediately after the set. Because why would you wait? Because you're only getting closer to the, the average, which is one out of six rolls. And so, you know, that's where that came from. So I guess the progression, if I was to do it now, knowing what I know now to explain to people, the safest thing you could ever do is the reverse fire bet. However, you have to be cognizant. Now I'm going to take this an extra step. You can offset the pass and don't pass yeah, you can offset the don't pass and pass and do straight odds. So you could have a four point and do four dollar odds on a ten dollar minimum bet. That's how you skirt a higher minimum is do offset pass and don't pass and do two dollars on a four. And then you can keep progressing that to do something like that. So I'd start there. The easiest to keep you um 
the easiest to sit here and get to the point where you like have some action would be the seven seven press, which requires a pretty big bankroll for you to continue on down that. Mm-hmm. Third would be the four ten hedge, only in profit the five nine hedge. And then if you have a, a I'd say a five thousand minimum, you'd sit here and go, Hey, I'm gonna do the lay four and ten. That's how I would start. But to be honest with you, John, I know it sounds you know, I don't charge mm-hmm. anything. I don't sit here and I just sit here and do stuff on Discord these days waiting for the internet. But like to me, I tell people, regardless of what strategy you want to use, regardless if you like anything from anybody, there's an old saying that says, you cannot fill a cup that's already full. So to me, when I look at craps on YouTube, is that you're supposed to take the best of us and make it better. Just like standing on the shoulders of giants like Jules Verne said. So I say to everybody, you sit here and take strategies from everybody. You cherry pick what's best about it, create your own, Practice it to oblivion in private and then come with a plan mm-hmm. to a casino, regardless of where you're at. Whether- That's the thing. You practice like crazy. I practice. I practice. I started my channel because I, I was literally filming myself practicing to give myself like a reason to practice. And like it puts a burden on you. Like it's your, you're now you're accountable to like, you know, a thousand people to watch you practice. I think it's an yeah. important thing. So we are out of time. We got it. We're going to run. Um, didn't get to play though, man. Maybe I'll have you on again on my regular show. And I want you to work with, I have my table all set up here, um, with cameras and shit everywhere else. You can teach me. Um, let's play, let's have you on for one of my morning shows and work with me again. And just what's work strategy at the table. I want to see, I want to feel the chips move with your voice in my ear, man. Hey, anytime, any day, like I said, and I tell this to anybody, and this is just, this goes out to everybody, whether you agree with me or not. If you ever have a question about craps, if you ever have an issue about strategy, if someone is not willing to live in a casino or live on the show to you, like I don't care, the first subscriber ever got, he's like, I want to come to your house and learn. I'm like, why? Meet me at the casino. And so to you, I say, anytime you want to, man, we'll roll it out and see what we do. Yeah. And like Jacob says too, you know what? Roll it out at your, at your house and prove it wrong. Like we all do strategies, right? If they work or they don't work, we, you know, we're, we're open to it. We're open to all the criticism, dude. Thanks for your time. I, hey. I know it's late for you over there. I really, really, really appreciate that so much. And again, we'll get you on again. And we'll, I want to, I want to play actual dice with you next time. Cool. You're the bomb.com boss, man. I'll talk to you See later. You later, buddy. Thank you so much. Yep.